Podcasting from Astrolab Studios, this is Continuum Drag, a weekly podcast where we revisit sci-fi, fantasy, and just plain weird shows that have faded from the collective consciousness and didn't quite make the impact that they intended. This week, Frank Herbert's Dune, Part 3. Kill her! Kill her now! She's the abomination. The one the ancients warned us about. What is this? Look at her father. Can you not see it? She is the daughter of Duke Leighton. She is our Trades. Her brother is the Duke's son, Paul. He is the Muad'Dib. Impossible. Welcome to Continuum Drag, the podcast that has been sentenced to die in the desert. I'm Luke, here with my co-host Jordan. What's real, Jordan? Before we started recording, I said to Laura, I was like, I need something that's real. Luke's going to ask me and I don't have anything. And she just said, well, mention the pizza we just had. And I said, no one cares. No one wants to hear about the pizza. But I still did tell you about the pizza, but it was off the air. And again, no one cares. You didn't tell me what was on it. Oh, uh, <laughs> all right. Well, it was mushroom, green pepper. And pepperoni. I call that the Jordan. The Jordan? A nice average pizza. I get the exact same pizza every time, That that and that's what it is. A nice average pizza for a nice average man. Exactly. That's it. Wonderful. Everyone? That's what's real. Take out your phone, order yourself a Jordan right now. <laughs> yeah. I think it actually has a name. I think it's like a Supreme or something like that, but I refer to it as the Jordan. Well, that makes sense. You're, you are a Supreme. I take back the average man. You're a Supreme man. Thanks, man. Anytime. All right. Uh, you want to you wanna lead us in? Yeah. So I thought um, we would do something fun because it's Dune and it's the least fun thing ever. So uh, I thought we'd do a little game. And uh, I've changed the name as, as I like doing only because I think it makes it more enjoyable for me and hopefully for you as well. And uh, the game is called this week, you have to choose, share spice with, have a ponderous political maneuvering with, or send into the desert, but never check on the body. <laughs> Share spice with, have a ponderous political movement with, yeah. or send into the desert to die, but never check on the body. That's it. All right, I got it. All right, so here we go. And there's five rounds, and uh, we'll go through these quick. Round one, Paul, or Muad'Dib, however you, you prefer, is option one. Uh, Fade Rautha Harkonnen. Apparently that was uh, Baron Harkonnen. Oh, no, sorry. The nephew's name, which I never caught in three episodes. Biff or Handsome? Uh, it's Handsome. And uh, last option is Duncan Idaho, who I picked just because of his name. Great. I am going to share some spice with... Oh, man. These are... It's harder than I thought, actually. I'm going to share some spice with Handsome Harkonnen. Yeah. I'm going to have some ponderous political movements with duncan idaho and i'm gonna send paul into the desert and never check on the body i'm gonna agree with you on that it just makes sense you know the handsome guy very handsome gonna spend a little spice with him be a fun time i think all three men are handsome to be fair that's true but he you saw his muscles though you saw him when he was like bathing and his like I did, flexing yeah. that oil <laughs> you gotta see a little bit of butt crack oh and what a butt crack <laughs> round two lady jessica Princess Irulan, I guess you pronounce it, and Cheney. I'm going to share some spice with Cheney. I don't want to spend too long with her. I, I, unlike Paul, I don't think I could spend my whole life with her. Yeah. I'm going to get into some ponderous political movements with the princess. She of all the characters, and probably because she's partly originally written, I don't know, she she irritated me the least. And uh, Lady Jessica, you're, you're going out to the desert, and I'm never going to check on the body. We're two for two. I agree with you again. It is funny. I think it's pretty clear which characters in this are like ones you can put up with. Let's test that theory. Round three. Gurney, Stilgar, Leto, or Leto. I don't know how to pronounce his name. Leto? Leto. I'm going to I'm gonna share some spice with Gurney, the war master. He's just a, he's fun. He's a fun little, uh, fun little war master. Then I'm going to get into some uh, ponderous political movements with uh, Duke Leto. Uh, you know, William Hurt. That, why not? 
And um, yeah, Stilgard's going out to the desert to die. I, 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 I never formed an attachment to him. I think I'm going to disagree with you. I think I'd send Gurney to the desert because I couldn't remember who he was. He came back in episode two or something. They're Gurney. I was like, who is he? So <laughs> I'm just going to send him to the desert because he's, he's not memorable to me at all. You didn't like when he played his uh, space loot and drank his uh, spice beer? See, I did, but I forgot who he was because I was so bored out of my mind. <laughs> it affected my memory. All right, round four. Uh, this one's a little tricky. You got to really think about this one. I am impressed you got four rounds out of this. All right. Well, there's five rounds. <laughs> we got... <laughs> I know, it was tough. Reverend Mother Gaius Helen Moheim. That's the lady from the beginning who burns Paul's hand. Old Reverend Mother Romalo and young Reverend Mother Romalo. She's the one later who um, takes her essence and puts it into Jessica. So you got the old right. version and the young version of her. Okay. Okay. An all Reverend Mother category. Exactly. Oof. I am going to... I'm going to share some spice with uh the reverend mother who's uh the the conniving one not the one from dune that's uh reverend gaius? mother gaius helen moheim apparently yeah yeah i'm gonna share some space with her i'm going to uh get into some ponderous political movements with uh the young version of the dune reverend mother what was her name just young reverend mother romalo great and other reverend mother romalo uh, just because I'm an ageist, you're you're going out to the desert, and I'm never going to check on the body. I have to disagree. You got to send Moheim out after the desert. She's trying to burn your hands all the time. Oh, but, you know, a little pain, a little pleasure. <laughs> well, you know what? <laughs> Different strokes. <laughs> uh, and last round, we've got Emperor Carino, who, by the way, shouldn't he be in plane by uh, Ricardo Montalbán? That's pretty good, actually. <laughs> um, <laughs> Unrelated. Option two, Baron Harkonnen. And finally, I just called the character Batman. I don't know what those, the little bat creature that flies the ship. So I just called it Batman. The Navigators. Yeah, so you can pick the Navigators, one of your options too. So again, Emperor Carino, Baron Harkonnen, Batman. All right. I'm going to share some spice with Baron Harkonnen because uh, he looks like he has a good time. Has some good wine, I'm sure. Some good food brought in. Then I guess I'm going to get in ponderous political movements with... Uh, the Bat Boys, you know, they can take me places. They got that uh, Sixth Sense, whatever they've got. They, they And they look gross and flappy. I like that. And I guess that just sends the Emperor into the desert. Um, eh, he's a bit of a buffoon. I just want to make a note. You said they're gross and flappy. You like that? Yeah. Huh, interesting. I think I would, uh, I'm going to disagree with you on this one. I would share spice with uh, the Batman. I would have political maneuvering with Embry Carino, and I'm sending Baron Harkonnen off into the desert because he's just trouble. Just trouble. He can fly out there showing his little leg garters. He's got his little floaty thing. I love that. I love that too. Another reason to share spice with him. It's true. And that's it. That's pretty much all the characters. By the way, I, I did this as I do, looking through the characters on IMDb. There are so many characters that I have no idea who they are. <laughs> I mean, it's in this last episode, they seem to introduce all... At least one Fremen warrior that I think we're supposed to keep track of with face tattoos. I don't know who that was. I don't know why he suddenly appeared or why it was important. Did they always have face tattoos? Because I only really noticed in this episode. Or is that a no, new no, thing? No, I think it was like brand new. And I think it was just so he could track like that one guy. Ah, uh, anyway. Yeah, I, I agree with you. There, a bunch of people just started showing up with blue tattoos. And I was like, oh, okay, sure. At this point, I'm not paying attention. So, <laughs> All right, let's get into it. All right. Here is the IMDb summary for Frank Herbert's Dune, Part 3. Paul Atreides, who has become known as Paul Moadib, leads a rebellion against the Harkonnen, who have the secret support of the Emperor. That's pretty good. Where did that come from? This is IMDb. That's just uh, no uh, uncredited. Uncredited. No one ever wants credit for it. Uh, and, I, you know, one thing I think we didn't mention in the last episode is that uh, they did a little classic uh, TV film thing here to show that Paul aged which was the game a new haircut. We didn't talk about that, did we? Was that in the last episode? This was that this was this episode. Is it this episode where he gets it? Well, because originally he had his hair like kind of down and parted, and now it's up and it's like all electric. We'll get into it, I guess now. Um, but the this episode starts and the narrative has jumped forward like how many years? Well, that's a, I wasn't sure at first. A guy thought, "Oh, it's been like a couple months, but it's clearly been I would say maybe two, maybe three years. Paul's little sister is at least seven or nine years old. I think it's been nearly a decade. 
Right. Which um, I should say, apparently, and Luke, you would have known this. Apparently in the book, he started out at like 15 years old or something, right? I think that's the case. Yeah, I think he starts off quite young and then he ages over the course of the book. Right. So I think they were trying to do that. And maybe I'll forgive a little bit of his whininess because of that, because I think the actor was probably supposed to be playing something like a young, petulant child. And it just comes across weird when you're clearly like a 25 year old man. I thought he was much better as this version of Paul as compared to the beginning. Yeah, I mean, credit to this actor like this part is the one where he's really shining. Yeah, he, he's uh, he's much less annoying because at the first I was like, this is the guy who chose to be the star of the movie. But I was like, he's not bad at the end. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's it. Like so many years have ha- gone by like his Paul's sister's all grown up to well, grown up. She's like seven or nine years old. He has a son who's got to be what a year and a half, two years old. Yeah. He, and he's even like got those blue eyes now. Like he's been there so long. His eyes have turned blue. Mm-hmm. And we talked about it. It, it really does look good. The eyeballs. It's true. But yeah, it's it's a huge jump in time. They, they don't even have like a title card saying like nine years later. Where you're just suddenly like, whoa, what happened? But they what they should have done is had everyone have d- beards. That's always a good indication that time has passed, you know? Just big beard grows. Mm, a lot of time's gone by. Everyone. Everyone has beards. Well, Jordan, uh, I do want to continue going, but you made a promise to us, the listeners and me, at the beginning of this. Yeah. And you need to fulfill that promise today. And I think what you're asking is, what is the title to this part? Yes, please. It's called Part 3, A Single Tear is Treasured. Wonderful. Oh, it's every part you've done titles for has been amazing. Thank you. I was so looking forward to hearing what the final one was and whether it would live up to the last two. And you did it. Thank you. I appreciate it. It's, it's probably my biggest accomplishment so far this week. I'm so happy. You have no idea. All right. Let's keep going. <laughs> okay. Essentially, now that we're sort of in the future, uh, the Fremens are really putting the heat to the Harkonnens. They're doing a lot of guerrilla attacks. We're getting to see, like, cool five-barreled shotguns, and the Fremens have these, like, wrist-mounted crossbows. Yeah, I like the crossbows. Here's a, here's a question for you, though, Luke. Um, and th- Because we're going to see battles kind of throughout this episode. This is really the, the end of everything we've kind of built towards. So you get a lot of battles kind of throughout, and obviously a big battle at the end. Do the Fremen, they never use guns, right? Never. In fact, in this episode, we'll see Stilgar pick up a gun, but that's the first time I've seen one use a gun. Okay, that was my question. Now, here's the thing. I know they have, like, they're sort of like a a very uh, fervent religious uh, kind of awakening happening. They're really passionate and stuff. But honestly, if you have a bunch of guys with lasers and the other guy's got knives, I think my money's on the guy with lasers. Yeah, well, that's just how powerful they are. I suppose. All right. Well, let's let's get back into that. I'll just keep peppering my little uh, complaints as we go. <laughs> but yeah, basically the the battles on the Fremens are really kind of kicking ass. I mean, even at some point we see a like a, a kid, like an eight year old, stab a soldier to death. Like the like the Harkonnens are losing. I had to say I hated that, and I'll tell you why I hate that. Isn't that the worst trope ever? The, the person who they're cornered and they think they're uh, they're not going to be able to get away. And then suddenly the person who's going to attack them goes and then falls over. And there's someone behind them who stabbed them. I'm so sick of seeing that. That and, and fat costumes for comedy just need to be retired entirely. You're done with those tropes? I'm done with those, yeah. I mean, you're not wrong. There's not much suspense to them. Yeah, I mean, good on the kid. He's a little, he's a little uh, cool kid, but, you know, come on, guys. Let's think of something more original. Everything has been, you know, not going the Harkonnen way. The Baron is still sort of pushing a plan where he's going to, like, still put his handsome nephew in charge and, like, throw his dumb nephew under the bus. And this is all a larger plan because he's hoping that he can take over the Emperor at some point. But even that's not going well because when we first catch up with him, the Baron's, like, in bed with a with a very um, nubile nude man who he's murdered uh, because his nephew, the handsome nephew, has sent that man to kill him. Yeah, it's... Uh... I guess I guess what they're really just showing is that there's no honor with within them. It's sort of like every man's out to get what they can get. And the nephew and the uncle are no exception. I love it when he called his nephew and he says, like, you think you could pull one over on me? This little conspiracy to kill me with this hot guy. He's like, I knew what was up. And they walk over and they touch the, the guy's naked thigh and a needle like sticks out of his thigh. I think this might be a, a Harkonnen thing because we won't ruin it for later. But weird little needles coming out of people's body seem to be a uh, a real trick that they use. Yeah, well, I think they did that with certainly with uh, Leto, 
And I think we've seen a needle somewhere else, too. Like, I think this is a big thing for them. Like, poison. Oh, it was the little hunter seeker. That's the right. Little, like, yeah. They really love a poison needle. Small but deadly. That's what's on their uh, their family crest. On their family tombstone now. Oh! Spoiler. <laughs> well, you know they're going to lose. <laughs> Paul, he's having crazier and crazier visions now. Uh, there's one he has here where he imagines or he envisions three sandworms that like emerge from the sand and like do an erotic dance in the moonlight for him before the entire planet turns into grass. Well, that's why you don't let those sandworms do those erotic dances. It was uh, one of my favorite visions, those worms. He also now uh, looks and acts like he's a Jedi master. Oh, yeah. It's it's all... Everything he says is some sort of weird metaphor for something. Yeah, like he's gone from being really whiny to... Uh, being sort of this uh, adventure type. And now he's just this guy who only speaks in cryptic messages. And everyone's just like, "Uh, uh, okay. He's like, "Uh, can't you not see uh, the sand of the future? And you're like, what? And then he just like walks off. That's probably why we find out uh, quite a few Fremens are trying to challenge him and kill him to take over his leadership. Uh, They're very annoyed with these cryptic messages. Yeah. And well, they imply that he's, it's been happening a lot, right? Yeah, definitely we see one or two people take a, take a shot at him. And he tries to, like, kind of prove himself here. Apparently, he hasn't driven the worm bus yet, so uh, he has to go out into the desert to prove he's a Fremen by, like, taking those hooks and climbing on a worm as it drives by and showing everybody he can drive a worm. He seems like he's had to have a lot of different tests to prove he's, uh, he's a loyal Fremen. Well, over the course of this, there's going to be this idea that he has to still kill Stilgard to become the full, like leader so it just like there's always seems to be a new test he has to do yeah and even he seems like he's getting tired with it yeah he's just like you guys how many more visions do i have to have before you believe me yeah exactly (laughs) that old war master gurney you talked about earlier he comes back after being missing all of last episode he's i guess he's been smuggling spice out in the desert since he thought paul was dead Mm -hmm. but when he uh, falls for a fake uh, spice field he kind of gets trapped by the Fremen, and uh, of course, Paul finds him there. And then he he joins he joins Team Paul, um, and he also he also takes a brief moment to attempt to kill Paul's mom. Yeah, th- that was one of the many things in this book. And I know this this whole trilogy sort of plays out like uh, more like a checklist than an actual plot. Um, so like that was in the book. Check, we got that. Gotcha. This was a thing that you could have cut out, and it doesn't matter at all. Like it's like oh, it just it just happened a scene that has no repercussions whatsoever. Well, it's funny because the entire reason I think the scene is there, other than to check that box off, is there's one line at the very end where after they talk him down from killing his mom, because basically Gurney thinks the mom betrayed Leto and doesn't know that that, I don't know, whatever that guy's name was, Dr. Sunyu or whatever, did it. And Paul's upset about it because he couldn't see that future coming. So it means his visions aren't powerful enough yet. Like that's the whole reason that scene's there is for Paul to be like, "Mm, I can't quite see enough of the future yet. Anyways, it's not needed. There's a bit of a moment here where we get a little bit out of idea what's going on kind of out in the grander galaxy when they capture a a weird looking Baldo from the Spacing Guild. Yeah. Was this a guy we had seen before? No, I think all of the Spacing Guild are these kind of like slithery looking men in like big tall caps. So it's, it, I think it's easy to confuse them. I made a note that he should have been played by Christoph Waltz. <laughs> Different, right? It's, not, it's pretty good. Maybe in the new movie. Yeah. The one thing I liked about the Spacing Guild is this guy's really upset to have been captured. But all he's doing is he's like, we've got the proper forms. <laughs> you have to follow bureaucracy. Like he just keeps talking about forms the entire time. I like that they, they never rest on that sort of thing. And there's still more conversations about like uh, trade and its intricacies. It's like, guys, no one cares. No one cares about this. Yeah. Essentially, meeting this guy is supposed to show how freaked out the Spacing Guild is by how unstable things have become on Dune and how worried they are about the basically the flow of spice. They're, they're, they're starting to get very worried something might happen to the flow of spice, which is going to like totally destroy commerce in the galaxy. Because you have essentially a guerrilla renegades that are disrupting the normal flow of things. Yeah. And this will come up much later. I'm just going to get into it now because this scene, I was trying to figure out what it was there for other than telling us the Spacing Guild is worried. This is actually, I think, the moment where Paul is going to conceive of his master plan in which he decides to bury the water of life, that poisoned water his mother drank, under the biggest spice blow he can find that hasn't exploded yet. Right. And... First, I just have to say this. We talked a bit about them drowning that baby worm last episode. I finally pieced it together in this scene, in these scenes. 
they had to drown the worm and put the hood on it because you get the water of life from a drowned worm, they say. So that was that hood was actually the device they were using to take the poison water out of the drowned worm so they could do all of this. Wait a minute. So the water runs into the hood? Yeah. Yeah. I think when they put the hood on him, they were actually extracting water from the drowned worm so that Lady Jessica could drink it and become the new Reverend Mother. Wow, that's a lot of detail that they leave for the viewer to figure out, which is fine, but it's also funny because they spend so much time talking about, you know, I don't know, the roots of trees and stuff. Yeah, it's <laughs> it it took me a little while to piece together. I'm like, okay, some of this is starting to make a little more sense to me. And do you know exactly what his plan is? Like, if he puts this poisoned water of life in this spice blow and he sets the spice blow off, how is that going to destroy all the spice on dune i thought it had something to do with eliminating the sandworms but i wasn't i wasn't really sure what they what the idea was i had a little trouble following it too but my understanding was that blowing that up would then spread the poison water of life i guess in these spice blows there's like nests of worms or something which i guess makes sense if it's their poo but it would, <laughs> it would poison the worms in there and then it would slowly infect all the worms on Dune and essentially kill all the Dune worms and destroy all. Like, this is like, you know, in Discovery, the end of Star Trek Discovery, where the Klingons put a bomb in the volcano and the one gets to be the leader of the Klingons because they're like, well, if you don't let me do it, I'm going to blow up the entire planet. Like, this is kind of the same plan. I guess this whole thing is he is not bluffing, I guess, is what his, his point is. Or at least that's, the, that's what he's showing them. Yeah, he'll destroy everything. That, so this is kind of where he comes up with this plan to force his will upon the empire he and he says to them your days are numbered yeah and i mean the space emperor is pretty unhappy uh about what's going on on dune with the whole fremen spice situation he's he's really losing his shit over it um he's really tired of the baron's excuses and to kind of remedy the situation he decides to move the entire royal palace to dune and uh has all the royal houses send their armies along with him right this is really putting all your eggs in one basket I understood the need for a reaction on his point, but it seemed like a very uh, nearsighted uh, sort of chess move. But I, maybe that was the point. You know what I mean? It's just like, of course, you're, you're going to lose everything now. I guess that's the gamble he, he was making. Yeah, you're going to go stomp them all out or you're just going to lose it all. And uh, we should say in this scene, there was so many weird hats. <laughs> oh, anytime you go up to the like galactic uh, emperor's place, you get a lot of great hats. The hats are nonstop. They're hat game. It's on point. <laughs> yeah, it's true. <laughs> Things aren't going great for Paul still, though. In fact, like Lady Jessica's pretty. His mom is pretty freaked out by kind of what he's becoming. And there's a there's a, they have a bit of a fight slash like an exhi- uh, exhibition exposition dump. Yeah, she tells him that she he should have been a girl and and she, he should have been married into the Harkonnens to end the feud and blah blah blah. I mean, it's kind of this. Is, I mean, it's a lot of dump of exposition, but it is kind of the interesting parts of going into the mythology of these books. Like, yeah, Lady Jessica is um, kind of upset with him because she's kind of was like, I thought we were putting on this whole Messiah thing and like, you know, using it to our advantage. And Paul's just like, no, no, I am a Messiah. Yeah. And she explains this sort of idea that she had him instead of a daughter and they were supposed to she was supposed to have a daughter but not just to unite the Harkin and houses it was the end of a multi-century Benny Jesuit breeding program yeah they drop that in and they come back to it a few times but I was like is this the first time we've heard of this no there was some indication about a breeding program but I think this is the first time we're hearing what the point of it was right and I think the idea was if she had had a girl and married it to the Harkin and nephew the child they would have bared would have created this Benny Jesuit prophet, the, uh, I'm going to try to pronounce this, Quizard, Quizats Hatterack, who I guess was going to be this being who would be able to perfectly predict the future and have a perfect memory. It'd be essentially be their messiah, the Benny Jesuit messiah. So either way, she was given birth to a messiah. Well, it, it worked out for her. She's <laughs> win-win. Yeah. It's a fun sci-fi idea, though like a centuries long breeding program that would like inevitably create something like you'd have that much planning in advance. Yeah. They must be really irritated when they see their, their, uh, their spreadsheet and they're, uh, they're looking at it and they're going, Oh, wait a minute. They, it's a guy now. Everything's ruined. You know, you got to go back and see where you didn't cross your T's. 
they played with it a little in that first episode when the Reverend Mother was kind of like giving her a talking, Lady Jessica talking to, but they really didn't imply like how much she fucked it up. But doesn't Jessica sort of say like she wanted to, uh, wanted a son, implying sort of like she chose the gender of the child? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. She said she wanted to give a son to Duke Leto because she loved him so much. So it's just like, she's like, yeah, I decided, yeah, he'll have a penis. Well, I mean, they have a breeding program, so they must know what they're doing. Ah, uh, fair enough. Anyway, after this fight, Paul heads back to the Fremen City because he he wants to get his vision up to the next level. He's like ready. To, he's ready to level up here. Yeah, he starts having some like real psychedelic episodes at this point. Yeah, he drinks the poisoned water of life like his mother did. And he basically goes into a coma. He drinks the water. He essentially is dead for all or he's in a coma. And uh, Cheney and Jessica both come visit him. And what is it? Don't the elders want him to take his water? They think if he's dead, they should take the water and, like, disperse it. But some of the people would think he's, like, in some sort of trance. There's some spiritual trance. But Cheney and Lady Jessica are able to get him out of it. Do you, do you remember how they got him out of the coma? Well, doesn't Cheney take a little bit of water and she puts it on his lips? Yeah, she just puts a little more poison water on him. And he just comes out of the coma and is like, well, I guess. He, just give him more poison. Yeah, and, he, and then he gets up and he's like, ah, I feel so rested. Oh, yeah. He is pumped. He basically stares lady jessica in the face and he's just like i'm something new now i'm the tool of fate yeah and he grabs her and he sort of projects his visions into her they kind of go back into it looked very similar to the light tunnel that she was in uh when she took i don't know the essence of that old lady i guess the whole point is he can kind of show her why he's actually is the messiah he can see the past future future and present all at once Mm -hmm. because yeah why not why not uh, we jump back up to space real quick because uh, all those crazy bundle ships have arrived at Dune because the whole royal palace has arrived to move in. And uh, the nephew, uh, Harkonnen nephew there, uh, pretty boy, he's uh, he's checking out the princess. He's like, hey, remember that time you're bathing me? And she's just like, uh, uh, uh. And I was like, well, that, that, that was a good scene. <laughs> well, there's there's kind of a lot of just stuff up there moving chess pieces around, I guess. Essentially, what's going to happen, though, is the Emperor is basically going to send forces into the southern deserts and try to, like, wipe out the Fremen once and for all. And they do have some success. They attack one of these Fremen settlements, and there's, like, a big massacre there. And we even get a scene where one one of the soldiers, like, pulls out a knife and, like, kills Paul's baby. So, yeah, you find it. Yeah, Paul and Cheney have had a baby, but you don't ever spend any time with them as a family or really learn anything about how they're different so you just like they killed the baby you're like huh how about that oh yeah i well it's true you i don't think you see paul even with the baby in one scene that's what i mean so it's hard to have a a sort of an emotional resonance other than they killed a baby but it's off screen so you know yeah Uh, i mean the one thing they do manage to do in this raid though is they managed to catch paul's sister uh, and in case we've forgotten, she absorbed all that, like, Benny Jesuit knowledge. So she's like some, like, super future-seeing genius child who talks far beyond her age and knows everything. She's a little bit cocky, I'd say. Would you say she's a little cocky? Oh, she's very cocky. <laughs> I It's what made me like the character so yeah, much. Yeah, she was all right. She was something different. It is funny, though, because they catch her here, but no one seems to notice for probably 45 minutes. <laughs> Yeah, it's just one of those things where, again, th- there's so many scene after scene after scene where you almost could like rearrange them in different in different orders, and it wouldn't really matter much to this. But essentially, this is getting us all the all the puzzle pieces are clicking into place for the final battle. Now that Paul's out of his coma, he he gives this inspirational speech to the Fremen to try to like rally them around him. But what I found very funny is it you know it's a big monologue, and it cuts back to this crowd of Fremen, and it's just like falls totally flat like no one responds to his speech yeah that was interesting right well i think what they were trying to say was what they really want him is to come out and say i'm the messiah and they all sort of chant that's what they want to chant and he basically says forget that forget these sort of silly rituals you guys want let's just you know do what i'm saying to do but really in the end they do start chanting that you know chanting for him it just takes a little while well he he puts on his dad's old ring and he says i'm your duke yeah like yeah (laughs) we should mention one thing real quick um, there's another scene just before this where he takes his dad's skull that they all they had left, and he's like, and they're like, oh, I should take this and uh, put it away, and he just like pulls a little panel on like a rock wall and just puts it there, and I just thought that thing's a hundred percent gonna get raided, <laughs> like that relic, would you like it's barely it's barely in the wall. Someone's gonna steal the Mahadib's dad's skull, but one hundred percent. 
<laughs> You're probably right. Yeah. Um, we get a little more hemming and hawing here from Lady Jessica. She she's now very worried about Paul and like how he wants to make these sweeping changes and like basically bring chaos to the galaxy. And uh, Paul out of this coma is if you thought he was a mystic before, he literally is just like ah, innocent, guilty. I don't really care. Everyone's gonna die. <laughs> He is acting sort of like this uh, god who doesn't care. It's just like, I have a vision. There's things that are going to happen. And whatever happens along the way is not my problem. Yeah. Well, he kind of finally shuts his mom down here because now that he can, he can see literally everything, he tells his mom, he's like, when you were taken as a child, I know who your dad is. Your dad is the Baron Harkonnen. Yeah. I, I, and I'll give this. I did not see that coming. No. That means Paul is his grandson, which in some way means I think the Baron wins, right? Well, it's it's funny because, the, the, you know, there's been a lot of talk of um, uh, family lines and this, you know, as you said, this sort of a uh, uh, selective breeding program and stuff. In the end, it all kind of worked out in one way or another, right? I mean, the two families all interconnected anyway. The Baron did want his legacy to be like running the emperor. And I mean, if that's his grandson, he kind of pulls it off. <laughs> yeah, it's just not the one he thought. Yeah, it's just a bit of a surprise for everyone. Yeah. <laughs> um, Paul sends a uh, letter to the emperor who's uh, taken up residency in the Palace of Dune, basically telling the emperor, it's like, here are the conditions of your surrender. So uh, get ready to like lay down your arms. Yeah, it was a real ballsy move. Yeah. And the emperor, no like. <laughs> the emperor, no like. That's true. <laughs> he uh, he pulls out Paul's sister, who's, who's his hostage now. And uh, this was probably my favorite scene with the sister, because she's just there and she's just sassing everybody. Yep. She's sassing the emperor. I know. She just comes in and starts going, just like, first she just starts going to town on the on the, uh, the baron. And then she goes to town on the emperor. And I'm like, oh, man, she's just a trash talker. Well, and then the Reverend Mother comes out and she's like, oh, she's a freak. And then she just starts trash talking the Reverend Mother. <laughs> yeah, she don't care. She don't care at all. I, I very much enjoyed this little girl just sassing these ass. Adult. yeah <laughs> and as she's doing that there starts being explosions outside paul and his fremen army are riding a sandstorm in for this final attack and in kind of the chaos paul's little sis tries to sneak out and, and the baron i guess he's trying to curry some favor with the emperor he like floats down and baron harkening like grabs the little girl and like he's like emperor i caught her i caught her for you but but unfortunately for him she's like a cat that doesn't want to be caught and she just slices him yeah, it's uh, it's it's the final irony for the poor Baron. She's got a needle covered in poison. Yeah, she was prepared. So that's I was actually a little disappointed. I didn't get a real good death scene from him. He sort of just floats away. Yeah, he sort of floats away and he's choking. What is kind of great, though, is they cut back to Paul's sister, who is, you know, also related. We've just found out. And uh, she looks up at the Baron as he's choking us. And he's just like, sorry, Grandpa. <laughs> yeah yeah it would have been better though if she was like she put like a grenade in his mouth and then pulled the thing and then said sorry grandpa and like kicked him out a window or something like that <laughs> see you at thanksgiving <laughs> yeah. Kicks out a window. yeah exactly like that <laughs> guess we won't need to stuff the turkey and then you know she pushes him out <laughs> i mean this battle is is a little perfunctory though there's one great moment at the start of it where the fremen are like ride sandworms into the city into battle i'm just like like that's pretty good like yeah you're gonna win for sure if you're doing that parts of that i thought the battle looked pretty good and some of the special effects looked pretty good but then they had this weird tendency of always wanting to do these slow-mos that they clearly uh, had decided in post which is the worst kind you know we're like oh, let's just slow this down and i just thought it looked terrible and they just kept doing it over and over and i was like all right guys this is already like a four and a half hour movie i don't think we need to slow down the action anymore oh yeah i mean the battles are pretty perfunctory there's not a lot to follow there's not major characters dying in them for the most part it's just kind of like pew pew pow fremen's win yeah uh, i mean the only thing we really get to see as far as like anything meaningful in the battle is is we get a quick chance to see the ugly nephew uh biff. of the harkonnens biff yeah good old biff he gets lynched by a crowd of fremen and i hadn't noticed it before but he's got that really close cropped hair but it's like dyed like a bright red yeah and that little that little street tough we saw earlier, he climbs into this like dog pile on on the Baron's nephew, and he comes out and he's cut his head off and he's holding it in his hands. I liked it, and it was a little bit more violent than what we've seen before. But I thought it was I was like, yeah, well, I guess that's what he gets. It was one of the few comeuppance in this movie that had like its own like moment, which was surprising because that character wasn't much of a character, but like they really gave him a, a death scene. Yeah, that's true. Well, that's what I mean. That I would have loved one for the Baron too. Wouldn't it be great if each of them had like their own unique scene, but at least we got one. 
Yeah. And kind of as we fade out of this, I wasn't entirely sure. I assumed the Fremen had won. I hadn't got a full sense of the scale of the battle. But we kind of come out of this into the throne room of the palace. And Paul is sitting on the throne. He's like dressed like the Karate Kid or something. <laughs> I wrote the same D. thing. He looked exactly like the Karate Kid. Yeah, ab- absolutely the same. And he basically tells the Spacing Guild to uh, have the navigators look into the future because they'll see what's coming and to get the hell out of here and essentially reveals his big plan to destroy all spice production on Dune. And it basically, you know, no one has anything they can do. They're basically damned. They have to listen to Paul. Paul's in charge now. Is it a given that if you take over a, uh, a, a politician or a government or a palace or something, you have to change your clothes immediately when you're in charge? You want to look good. You want them to know you got karate skills, and if anyone opposes you, you'll kick them in the face. Uh, Old Stilgar changed his clothes too. I mean, he's been wearing the same desert clothes for fifty-five years, and now he's like, "I'm going to change it up." No way. You don't think so? You don't think he wants to be fancy for one day? No, he's comfortable in those slacks he usually wears. Just like just filthy and smelly. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the thing. He doesn't know what a shower is. He's been t- he's been taking dirt baths like a bird. I guess no Fremen knows what a shower exactly. is. Exactly, it'd be obscene to them. Yeah. Anyway, all that all that wasted water. <laughs> this sort of like brings us kind of into this. The princess arrives. She's like, "There's no the only only one thing to do now, Dad. I gotta marry Paul. Solve all our problems. He's gonna be the new emperor. It's gonna be great." She came up and then she just goes, "Yeah, maybe you should just marry me," as if. If that was what they were talking about, or if it was a solution to a problem. That, like, it was just such a weird thing, and I was like, I think she just wants to marry him. Well, you know, it's like that's not the answer to everything. It's like, oh, you just got in a car accident. It's like, maybe you should marry me. I think it maybe not have been late as well as it could have, but I think she's been piecing together kind of first the conspiracy to kill the House of Atreides, and then what's been going on on the desert with Mohadib. I think we're supposed to think that she kind of has seen this end game coming quite a ways out. Right. So she's ready to solve the problem because she knew this is where they were going to end up. Right. I do like, though, that they sort of set her up earlier, uh, I think in the first part, where it's sort of, as you mentioned, she's sort of solving this uh, this mystery of what happened to Paul and and what was the emperor's involvement and stuff. And they sort of have, like, she's going to solve the case. But then, according to this, she really doesn't do anything for 10 years. Right. Like, she knows the emperor's involved, and then she's like, all right, we'll deal with that in 10. Uh, I'll know when my time's right. Exactly. You can't be a good detective until you get all the suspects into one drawing room. <laughs> That's true. That is true. You know what? I, I pulled back my complaint. It just took her a long time. Exactly. She also didn't age at all. She looks real good. Oh, it looks great. Great princess. Top notch. Um, because we were so worried about this one subplot with the handsome nephew who uh, I guess he thought he was going to marry the princess. So when he sees she's going to marry Paul, he's jealous. Yeah, he's like, that ain't going to happen. So let's both take our shirts off and knife fight. Yeah, it's it's time for a duel. He challenges Paul to a duel, and they have a classic knife fight. Not No diapers this time. That's they true. just take off their shirts. Yeah, that's true. And, um, you know, pretty classic kung fu fight. A lot, of, a lot of kicks and punches. He tries to pull one of those old Harkonnen uh, poison pin tricks on old Paul. Okay, I got a question for you. So, so that's what happens. They're pretty evenly matched. And at one point, old fake sting there pins Paul down. And uh, they're sort of like, you know, chest to chest. And a little spike comes out of his belt. And here's my point. So I get it. He All he had to do was kind of push down and he'll have poisoned him to death and he'll win the fight. But in what way? That's the only way that uh, that belt's effective. So he, he had to get into that move. Because at no other point yeah. is that going to be effective. Unless his plan was to accidentally bump into him when they line up for something. He had to get his pelvis directly against his body. And that's what I mean. It's just like, why not put it on your elbow or put it on your fist or put it on your knee? You're oh, right on your waist. I mean, Jordan, think about your everyday life. Like, how many times does your pelvis bump into a stranger? Well, for me, it's 75 to 80 times. Yeah, very common. Right. <laughs> anyway, it doesn't work for him because he should have put it on his elbow. Yeah, it d- doesn't work for him. And uh, Paul just ends up stabbing him in the face to death. <laughs> oh, well, what it is is he uses the old you're my cousin trick. And that that's what turns the tide. Uh, it always throws people. You just yell, like, you're my cousin. And you go, what? what? And you go, fight over i win yeah <laughs> and uh that's it paul's the emperor now uh he's won there's no one standing his way there's actually a weird moment where like the all the lighting in the scene like dims down and spotlights it onto the princess mm-hmm. and then cheney has kind of a narration over this 
kind of talking about how she's just like she's like slamming the princess Chenny's just like well I hope she enjoys writing her books because Paul is mine and she'll never get any of his love I know it was really weird I was like I guess that's a good ending. And then we have Cheney and Paul just sort of walk off into the sunset in the desert. Yeah, just walk into the desert to die. Who knows? Yeah. Well, no, no, check on them. <laughs> um, but yeah, that that kind of wraps up the movie. That really, it's uh, it's action packed for the most part. Whether the action is great, probably not. But it's at least packed full of it. All of the things that you know were kind of set up at least have some sort of conclusion. I think they ended up sticking a lot of the exposition that might have made the other parts more interesting into this back end. Mm. The reveals of how they're related to the Harkonnens and like what the what the Benny Jesuits are trying to breed through their breeding program and like I don't know I, that stuff was interesting and like mythology was fun to learn about. I maybe they maybe could have put it in other episodes because I just felt like I got the most interesting parts all in this final hour and a half. Right, but I will say though. Having watched this and kind of thinking about what's coming with this new uh, Denis Villeneuve Dune movie, Mm -hmm. I think there's a good movie in this plot somewhere. I think there was a good movie in this miniseries if they had just focused on the actual plot and the actual scenes that matter to uh, progress characters or progress the plot itself. Like, if you cut this into an hour and a half, it would be a pretty decent movie. I'm pretty hopeful that this new movie might actually be good. I think it's totally possible. Well, do you have some final thoughts? Well, I want to say something else about that movie that's coming. Sorry, Luke. You're going to be very excited to hear who Jason Momoa is playing. <laughs> who's, who's he playing? Duncan Idaho. <laughs> is he really? Yeah, Jason Momoa is Duncan Idaho. Is he going to have it be shirtless and show off his tattoos and have long hair, I assume? One hundred percent. Yeah, I do. I have to say, I do like actors that show up and are like, this is what I look like. So that's what the character looks like now. huh?" And they're like, "Uh, "Okay, can you do an accent? No, no, this is what he sounds like, too. It's like the old uh, Sean Connery playing a Russian. He's like, guess what Russians sound like? Scottish. It's 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 classic. It's what we want. Yeah. And uh, you want to know who Baron Harkonnen is? I mean, who would be great would be uh, uh, Marlon Brando in about 1992. If only we could go back in time or CG him. Who is it? Stellan Skarsgård. Oh, wow. I wouldn't have picked that. He'll be in a fat suit. Well, you know what? It uh, it can't be as ponderous as this anyways. Certainly not. Shall we rate this final part, Jordan? I'm going to say I think this was better than the last one. I still, though, think there not, not enough was sort of set up that made me feel like anything really was resolved. Like kind of despite the impressive sets and costumes and even some of the special effects, everything still comes across kind of stagey and empty. And I just think it's because nothing, as I kind of mentioned before, nothing really resonates because you don't really care about the characters. You know, you have characters having a child and the child dies and I'm supposed to feel sad, but but I've never seen any interaction with the child, so I don't really care. And that sort of is how I feel about the whole thing. It's like, oh, he becomes uh, the emperor at the end or whatever he is. Like, all right, who cares? So I'm going to give it a four and a half. Four and a half. Obviously, I've not loved the past two episodes. And there's a part of me who's just like going to still hold this part three accountable for the sins of the other parts. Mm -hmm. So I I was considering going one, but it is definitely better. There's more going on. It's still plotting and slow and has all the same problems, but at least it's the climax. Mm -hmm. So I guess I can't go as high as three still, though. So it's a two. That's a pretty low uh, ranking we have for all these three episodes. What do we come out to? Let me let me. uh, Boot up the old continuum drag computer here for you. Yeah, hold on. <laughs> Get the dust off it. Just gotta blow out the cartridges before we <laughs> stick them. <in. laughs> yeah. And final rating for Frank Herbert's Dune, the miniseries. Two point nine two. That's so embarrassing. It was bad. It was a bad show. <laughs> It was bad. I agree. I think you're right. Maybe somewhere there's an hour and a half or two hour movie that was a good idea, Mm -hmm. but it's lost in the sands of this movie. I mentioned it before, but I think trying to do a almost line by line literal version of the book is sort of what this comes across like. It's like reading a book, but somehow much more boring. The director really went for something. I just don't think it worked. Yeah. And that's a good way to sum it up. All right, well, now that that's done, Jordan, I think next week we're going to move on to a TV movie. We haven't quite talked about what that's going to be, so that'll be a surprise for everyone next week. Mm-hmm. 
But in the meantime, you can email us at continuingdrag at gmail.com if you have any thoughts on Dune or anything else we've uh, talked about. And uh, we'll definitely have some more images from the show on Instagram and Twitter at Continuum Drag. So I guess that about wraps up for the show, Jordan. I hope uh, your body's moisture stays wet. And I hope you treasure every single tear. Oh, thank you. (laughs) See you later. Continuum Drag is recorded at Astro Lab Studios in Toronto, Ontario. Theme music by James Rick Seedler. Produced by Jordan Delick and Luke Black. Special thanks to Adam Wheatner, Jeff Hanley, and Dwayne Wright.